Stay hungry, stay foolish. Thanks as always to our sponsor Zai. Zai is a global fintech that's innovating within its own field of expertise, building integrated financial services for digital native and non native businesses. By supporting them, you're supporting us. Please check them out at hellozai.com. Our guest today is an American psychologist who has carried out experiments on cognitive dissonance and invented the jigsaw classroom a cooperative teaching technique which facilitates learning while reducing inter-ethnic hostility and prejudice. In his 1972 social psychology textbook, The Social Animal, he stated his first law, people who do crazy things are not necessarily crazy, thus asserting the importance of situational factors in our bizarre behavior. He is the only person in the 120 year history of the American Psychology Association to have won all three of its major awards, including writing, teaching, and for his research. In 2007, he received the William James Award for Lifetime Achievement from the Association of Psychological Science, in which he was cited as the scientist who fundamentally changed the way we look at everyday life. A review of General Psychology survey published in 2002 ranked him as one of the most cited psychologists of the 20th century. He officially retired in 1994 but continues to teach and write. It is an immense honor to host him on today's show and share his brilliant work. We welcome the author of The Social Animal amongst a plethora of other titles. Elliot Aronson, welcome to the show. Good to be with you, Aidan. It is so great to have you on the show, Elliot. I thoroughly enjoyed the book. But let's get straight into it. There's so much to share today. We're going to go deep into the theories that you present in the book, but also into cognitive dissonance. And then we'll end up talking about the jigsaw classroom, this beautiful technique that you invented. But let's start with your philosophy. Because in this social animal, you say, it is a truism of science that the only way to really know the world is to reconstruct it. That is, to truly understand what causes what, we must do more than simply observe. Observation is obviously very important in science, but it's only the first step. We see something and we get an idea as to why that thing happens, and then we have to test it. So that, um, just to give you one example, um, the very first experiment I ever did, my hypothesis was that people who go through a severe initiation in order to get into a group, all other things being equal, will like that group better than people who get into that same group after going through a very mild initiation or no initiation at all. Now, the easiest way to, to test that hypothesis would be to go to an existing group that requires a severe initiation, like a college fraternity, or like the United States Marine Corps, which is known to be very, very tough in basic training and stuff like that, and then compare how much they like their group with how much people in mild initiation fraternities like their group, or how much people who get drafted into the army like their group. But that would not be good science. People who really want to get into a particular fraternity, in spite of the fact that that fraternity requires a severe initiation, will go for that fraternity. Whereas those who don't care, they just want to be in any fraternity, will avoid going into a fraternity that requires a severe, nation, a, a severe initiation. So you would get a biased sample right off the bat. So what we need to do in science is reconstruct it. We need to take people and then randomly assign them to conditions and take half of them randomly and put them in a severe initiation condition that we construct and the other half into a mild initiation condition that we construct. That way, and that is the keynote, that's the key point of an experiment the random assignment of 
participants, two condition. That the only reason they're in one condition or the other is by flip of a coin, not because they volunteered. For we'll build our way slowly there, Elliot, because we will end up when we talk about the Jigsaw Classroom. The book is beautifully constructed. As we know, all roads lead to Rome. In a similar way, most of the early chapters in the book lead to this theory of cognitive dissonance. And I want to get to there, but I wanted to share some of the early frameworks and lenses through which we can look at cognitive dissonance. But I thought a great way to perhaps start is that you've had an immense career, you've had an amazing career. And I thought you might want to tip the hat to some of those people who had an immense impact on your career, particularly your consultant, your proofreader, this person who was a constant in your life, your wife, Vera, your children, and not to mention your friend and mentor, with a rocky start, Leon Festinger, may he rest in peace. You have a great story about your initial encounter that perhaps you'll share with us. That would he or wouldn't he moment about correcting your paper. Let's share this and then come back to Festinger, perhaps when we talk about cognitive dissonance. Yeah, uh, my family has always been very important to me. My wife, Vera, has always been my major consultant with any thought I ever had or any work I've ever done. And in addition to being my loving partner, my kids, uh, even when they were young, were very useful, were very always interested in the stuff that I was doing. And now that they've grown up, one of one of my sons has a Ph.D. in sociology, another one has a Ph.D. in social psychology. Uh, my daughter uh, has a master's degree in public policy. And my fourth, my uh, my second son, Neil. Uh, was a firefighter uh, with the uh, Santa Cruz Fire Department. And so he's in the trenches as someone who is doing good for people and has always been a great help to me and help me, help me clarify my ideas. But then academically, my two great mentors were Abraham Maslow, who was my mentor as an undergraduate and was a warm and caring guy and uh, is known as the, the founding father of the humanistic psychology uh, movement and uh, had some really good ideas. And, and his notion was, we need to use psychology to help improve the human condition and make the world a better place to live in. Uh, but he wasn't much of a scientist. Uh, as a matter of fact, he was a lousy scientist, to tell you the truth, but had beautiful ideas and a beautiful, a beautiful disposition and was uh, my first inspiration uh, when I was an undergraduate. Uh, but then uh, my mentor as a scientist was Leon Festinger, who is probably the smartest person I ever met in my life and also one of the most difficult. He, uh, he was a great taskmaster, had very high standards for himself and demanded very high standards of anyone who came near him, whether you were working with him or not. He, he was extremely challenging and very difficult. Um, one of my favorite stories about Leon Festinger uh, when I was a first year graduate student at Stanford, Festinger had just arrived and I didn't know very much about him, but he had a reputation already that came with him for being both brilliant and very, very difficult and very tough on graduate students, harsh on graduate students. And I was afraid to go anywhere near him for about six months. But then in the spring, he was teaching a, course, a seminar where he was developing this new theory called the theory of cognitive dissonance. And I was challenged by uh, one of the older graduate students to take that course. Um, and uh, I, I, in effect, he called me a coward for not signing up for it. So I signed up for it, but I was a coward. I was really afraid of him. And when I got into the course, I found out that everything people said about him was absolutely true. He was brilliant. 
and he was very, very tough and harsh. Um, I'll give you one example. He assigned a term paper about a third of the way through the course, and I wrote the term paper the way I write all term papers and handed it in. And a few days later, when I'm walking past his office on, my, on the way to my own office where I had a desk because I was a teaching assistant, uh, he called me in, Aronson, he said, come in here. And then he took my paper from a stack that was on his desk and he held it up between his thumb and forefinger, sort of like this, turning his head away from it and saying, I believe this is yours. <laughs> <laughs> and so I said, uh, uh, gee, Dr. Festinger, I guess you didn't like it very much. And he gave me a look, which was a combination of pity and contempt. <laughs> the contempt being because I was wasting his time and his time was very valuable to him. The pity was he was sorry for me because I had been born brain damaged or something. And he said, yeah, that's right. I didn't like it very much. And so I took the paper and I carried it down to my own office and sat at my desk and held that paper in front of me for about 10 minutes because I was a little intimidated, afraid to turn the page and see all the blue pencil marks on it and the margins and stuff like that. But finally I did open it and there wasn't a mark on it. So I gathered up all my courage and it took a lot and I walked back down the corridor to his office and I said, excuse me, Dr. Festinger, but you didn't write anything on it. How am I supposed to know what I did wrong? And he gave me that look again, pity and contempt, and said, what? You don't have enough respect for your own ideas to follow them through to their logical conclusion, and you expect me to do that? This is graduate school, Sonny, not kindergarten. So I took my paper and I walked the 26 miles back to my own office. I sat there wondering, I guess I better resign from this seminar because he obviously hates me and thinks I'm a moron. And I, I could flunk out of graduate school. And here I was with, um, with a, a young baby, uh, about a year old, and another baby on the way. And I couldn't, I, I, this would be dreadful. But then I sat and I did reread my paper and I realized that he was absolutely right. It was a half-baked, terrible piece of work. So the choice point was, do I quit the seminar and work with somebody else or do I stick it out with him? And I, realized, I asked myself, do you really want to work with this son of a bitch? And my answer was yes. This is the smartest guy I ever met. And I loved the theory he was just developing and I wanted to be part of it. It sounded, it was just really exciting. So I went home and I re spent the next three days rewriting that paper. And it felt like 72 consecutive hours. It wasn't, but it, I really put more effort into that paper than anything else I had ever done before. And I came back and I put it on his desk. I came into his office, put it on his desk and said, maybe you'll like this one better. To his great credit, he must have dropped whatever he was doing because 20 minutes later, he came into my office, sat on the corner of my desk, put his hand on my shoulder and, and put the paper in front of me and said, now this is worth my criticizing. This is worth my criticizing, which sounds kind of funny. You know, he's going to give me the great gift. He's going to tell me what's wrong with the paper. But it is a great gift because he was willing to give me his time. And what he was telling me is, if you meet me halfway, if you give me the best work you're capable of, I will give you everything I have. And that to me is the epitome of mentorship. And what, what happened then is at that moment, we became teacher and student. 
within a few months, we became, he began to treat me as a colleague. And within a year, we became very close friends. And it was all because I decided that I was going to give him my best work. Give him my best work? That's bullshit. I was giving myself my best work. It was, it was, there's a marvelous poem by Pablo Neruda when he talks about the first time he went his own way and wrote a poem the way he wanted to write it rather than by aping other people's poetry. And he said, and something ignited in my soul, fever or unremembered wings. And I wrote my first line. And, and that's exactly the way I felt. I mean, many years later, I read that Neruda poem and I thought, oh my God, that's how I felt when I first started to do that work because I had, I had found resources in myself and creativity in myself that I never knew existed before. I absolutely love that story, Elliot. And the thing it evoked inside me is Plutarch's quote that the mind is not a vessel to be filled, but a fire to be kindled. Because I thought about how those people in our lives are rare, those people who give honest feedback. And oftentimes, we hold them with contempt, perhaps we are angry towards them in the moment. And then it's only years later, we appreciate what they did for us and how they did it. The root of the word education itself is educe, which means to draw out. And it seemed to me that that's what Festinger was trying to do here. He's trying to draw out your full potential. I want to add a little addendum to that one. Um, you don't have to be that harsh about it. You know, I mean, this was Festinger's style. This was his way. He did not suffer fools gladly. And at that moment in time, I was a, a fool. And he really shook me out of it. But he could have easily lost me. And he did lose an awful lot of pretty good students. Uh, in the few years that I was at Stanford working with Festinger, there were some terrific students who didn't want to work with him because he was so harsh in what my mother used to call the professor business. In the professor business, uh, <laughs> there are a lot of ways to be. Uh, sometimes being as harsh as Festinger really pays off but one doesn't have to really do it that harsh. There's something in between where you can be tough and warm and gentle. And with Festinger, to his credit, uh, once we got to know each other, um, uh, there was a, a great deal of warmth and a great deal of affection, but boy, you had to earn it. And uh, maybe, I mean, I didn't pattern myself after Festinger. I, I, tried to be tough, but I also tried to be uh, gentle and caring of my students. You talked about how oftentimes we judge people based on what we think are personality traits when they actually can be situational traits. I thought this would be really useful for those people, particularly in leadership roles, or roles where they're seeing people's behaviors, and they might go, actually, that's not a reflection of that person's personality, but rather a reflection of the environment that they're in or the situation that in which they find themselves. That's where Aronson's first law comes in that you quoted earlier. Uh, I, I stated that as a first law as, as a kind of a, I, I was teasing myself. I didn't, uh, I, I had my tongue in my cheek when I said that, because I was trying to emulate the physicists, the, those real scientists, the physicists, who keep coming up with first laws, second laws, third laws. So I figured Aronson's first law, the one basic law that I would state about social psychology is that people who do crazy things are not necessarily crazy because one of the things any social psychologist worth his salt or her salt really believes in is the power of the situation. And yet most people, most of the time, attribute personality to something that isn't a function of personality, but is a function of the situation that the person is in. So for example, if you're driving your car and somebody cuts you off, 
the first thing you want to scream at the guy is some expletive that calls him an idiot or something like that, because you think this is a careless, terrible person. Why is he doing that to me? Now, maybe he's in a hurry because he's driving his child to the emergency room of the hospital because the child has a burst appendix and he needs to get there in a hurry. But we don't give him that benefit of the doubt. We assume there's something wrong with him. And this is what um, my dear friend Lee Ross, a social psychologist, calls the fundamental attribution error. Whenever something happens in the world, whenever somebody does something, we make an attribution. And basically, there are two kinds of attributions. There's the dispositional attribution, which is about the personality of that person. Crazy, uh, idiotic uncaring, or situational. This person may be under a lot of stress. This person may be behaving in a way that he usually doesn't behave in because he's really in a hurry. Uh, and it's an important thing for him to be in a hurry. So we usually give our close friends the benefit of the doubt by making uh, situational attributions. But for the most part, we give people we don't know dispositional attributions, which are frequently wrong, which Lee Ross calls the fundamental attribution error, and which I call people who do crazy things are not necessarily crazy. And when we do experiments in social psychology, take, for example, the famous Milgram experiment, which we will also get to, um, we, we can put people in situations in the laboratory that are very high powered and where we can get honest people to behave dishonestly. We can get kind people to behave cruelly. We can get smart people to behave stupidly and sane people to behave crazily. We can do that in the laboratory for a short space of time so that we know how powerful situational factors can be. We'll share some of those experiments as we progress. But I thought one that's really interesting is when you think of many people in our audience work in transformation roles or innovation roles, 75% plus of these digital transformations fail, these efforts fail, change initiatives fail. And they fail for the same reasons that you cite in the book, these weaknesses in human behavior. We don't create the right environment, we don't use the right language, we don't incentivize or reward people right, we don't label things right, we don't use all the right priming for people, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And one of the most fascinating ones, one of the most fascinating studies you mention in the book, and it's been made into a movie since is Philip Zombardo's your friend and colleagues, Stanford prison experiment, because this shows that in certain conditions, when people are labeled a certain way, they can actually adopt behaviors that are, they may not be proud of in the future. And this we see in the world's worst catastrophes from holocausts to genocides, that people's behaviors change starkly based on the conditions in which they find themselves. Under extreme conditions, we are capable of doing some terrible things. Um, and uh, the Stanford prison experiment that uh, Zimbardo did, very well-known experiment. The hypo I absolutely believe in the hypothesis. I, it was, I have to tell you, it was, it's a very, very difficult experiment to run because uh, that experiment lasted for six days. And what he did, in effect, was take a bunch of young people, mostly students or graduate students, um, and he assigned half of them to the prison, the prisoner condition and half of them to the guard condition randomly. So that they were random, again, random assignment. And then put them in a, a mock prison for six days, um, which by itself is an extreme situation. We're not, we, we don't, we cannot do experiments like that anymore. No experiment should ever last, last more than an hour or two in social psychology. That's the new ethical standard 
that was inspired by the Stanford prison experiment, by the way. Uh, and what Zimbardo found was that the people in the prisoner condition within a very short time, within a couple of days, began to behave like prisoners do in the real world, in the real prisons. They were either very docile or rebellious, but they were something like that. And the people who were assigned to the guard condition, many of them, not all of them, but a few of them anyway, were hostile. The, the, having that power and having that authority and having that, uh, that assignment to keep order turned them into people. They were doing things that they never would have believed that they would do. They were harsh, they were cruel, and a lot of behaviors like that. Now, again, I want to state, the Bamford Prison Experiment has a, a, some flaws in it as a, as a piece of research, but the hypothesis is right, and I think Zimbardo did the best he could with that, and it's still a really important lesson to be learned. One of the things I really wanted to share for those people who work in large legacy organizations or leaders of organizations to prevent this from happening is silo behavior. When people go into their departments, don't interact, don't collaborate, don't cooperate in this age where we need that more than ever before. And you identify this, the in-group and out-group bias and how sometimes when groups are assigned into those groups with no rationale, with the flip of a coin, they still behave as if they belong to that group. And so much so that if you and I were assigned to the same group, I'm more likely to give you money, even as a stranger, than somebody else who's in a different group, just because they're labeled in a different group. That's kind of tribalism that w that we see in the world today. You know, people are uh, uh, very tribalistic. Uh, and and what um, what that those experiments showed is that it can be the people know that their assignment is random. They know they have nothing really deeply in common that they, with the people they're in the same group with. They could have been in a group with the other people, but suddenly those other people become the out group. And when you think about it, when you think about what difference does it make as God sees it that one people, one person is black and another person is white? What possible difference could that make? And yet it makes a hell of a difference in their lives in, in almost every culture that any of the Western cultures that we live in. Our own Irish playwright George Bernard Shaw said, the reasonable man adapts himself to the world, the unreasonable one persists in trying to adapt the world to himself. Therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable man or woman. And I thought that was a very interesting quote for what we're going to talk about next, because building towards cognitive dissonance, we need to understand conformity and the the social animal, the human animals desire to conform because that whole idea of in group out group outside the tribe may mean certain death for me 200,000 years ago when I emerged from the caves. Therefore, I'll be intent, I'll be inclined to conform towards the group in order not to be ejected from the group. Let's share some of Solomon Ash's great work on conformity. But before that, let's start with your view on conformity. Uh, well, before I even describe the Ash experiment, I want to make the distinction that I make in the social animal between three levels of conformity, compliance, identification, and internalization. You can get people to conform, to comply with your wishes easily. If you pay them enough money, most people will do almost anything. Or if you threaten them with harsh punishment, most people will do almost anything to avoid it. That's compliance. Uh, I'll give you one quick example. Uh, during this uh, pandemic, 
I live in Santa Cruz, California, which is a beach city, in addition to being a university town. We have a lot of wonderful beaches, and people come from all over to, to swim in the beaches. The city council passed a law saying you have to wear a mask. People coming from out of town, many of them didn't like wearing masks. So especially outdoors on the beach, why should I have to wear a mask? So they didn't wear a mask. Then the city council upped the ante and said, anyone not wearing a mask will be found, fined $1,000. And they enforced it. Within a couple of weeks, everybody was wearing masks. That's compliance. The question is, did that get them to believe that wearing masks was a good thing? And the answer is no. And what I will demonstrate, what I have demonstrated in my life and what I'll be happy to do on this podcast, is that there's some good research showing that the more you pay them or the more you find them for doing it, the less likely they are to believe in the thing, for the thing to become internalized. And with a great many things, what you really want is internalization. You want people to take that idea and make it their own. When you bring up your child and you want your child not to beat up on his little brother, you want to teach him the lesson that it's not good to hit kids who are smaller than you, it's not good to hit anybody, but if you're going to hit somebody, pick a fight with a big guy, you want that to be internalized. You don't simply want him to comply with your desire. You want him to develop a set of values. And that's what internalization is. And that's the most permanent kind of conformity. In between is what I call identification, which is you believe something not because somebody is threatening you, but because you like or admire the person who believes it. And I call that the good old Uncle Charlie phenomenon. You have <laughs> an Uncle Charlie who is a conservative, who hates immigrants because they don't speak the language correctly and they live in squalor and I don't like immigrants because they, you know, they're always in the way and whatever, and they're always driving taxi cabs um, without, real, without, without really thinking about it. You adopt those ideas because you like Uncle Charlie and you admire him. And so you develop his ideas. And then you become 18 years old and you go to a really nice university where most of the professors are liberal and you learn other things. You learn how much immigrants give to the country and how, how many immigrants have won Nobel Prizes and how many immigrants have been really important innovators and, and how difficult it was for them to come to this country and how they deserve, many of them deserve our deepest respect. And you change your mind because you have learned information which now becomes internalized because it makes sense. And that's one way that an idea becomes internalized. Now, if we take the ASH experiment, where it's a very classic, very well-known experiment where people are judging the relative length of lines, so very simple te uh, test where uh, if left alone, people are right 100% of the time in comparing lines, which, which of these lines, which is this line closer to one of these three other lines? People don't make a mistake. But then you put a person in a room with four or five other people who are your stooges, and the, your stooges are programmed so that they always guess the wrong line or many, on many occasions guess the wrong line and they come before the actual participant and then that participant is thrown into confusion because he doesn't, what, what the other people are telling him are, is dissonant with his own eyesight um, and what does he do? Well it turns out that about two thirds of the people go along with the group. 
And the question then becomes, is that compliance or internalization? Do they really come to believe that those lines that the group falsely identified are the correct lines or not? Well, it turns out that it is mere compliance, that they went along with the group mostly because they were afraid of being ridiculed. They don't like to be against the group. As I say over and over again, human beings are social animals. Part of what that means is that we're dependent on other people and we want to belong. We want other people to like us, even if the group is a transient group. So we don't want to go against the group. We don't want the group to think we're stupid or rebellious or ridiculous. So we go along. But it's only compliance and uh, not internalization. Speaking up against power or speaking up against behaviors or principles for your own standing up for your own principles is something we've talked about on the show multiple times, Elliot. And I thought about how you mentioned the work of Gregory Burns in the book and how it's not just standing up is a social pain. It's not just breaking conformity. It's not just the psychological barrier that we have to traverse. It's actually painful for the brain. You showed this when you cite the work done by Gregory Burns. If I stand up against power, if I disagree in a group that strongly agrees, just like in the Solomon Ash exp experiments, my amygdala lights up. It's actually the equivalent to physical pain for my brain. And it's the amygdala, the same as someone giving you an electric shock, going against the group has the same effect on the same part of the brain. Yeah. Very interesting stuff. I'm going to quote a piece next, Elliot, because this says a lot about those people who run organizations who decide to go against the business model that perhaps is yielding results, the business model that's well worn path. The one that is milking is is uh, milking the cash cow is taking from the golden goose, and they decide to go a different route, and it's very much not popular within the organisations they run. And you say, one consequence of the fact that we are social animals is that we live in a state of tension with values associated with individuality and values associated with conformity. When we look a little closer, we see an inconsistency in the way our society seems to feel about conformity in brackets team playing and non-conformity in brackets deviance. For example, one of the best-selling books of the 1950s was a book by John F. Kennedy called Profiles in Courage, wherein the author praised several politicians for their courage in resisting great pressure and refusing to conform. So this is where politicians introduce taxes for the future of the company, who solicited laws, who made decisions that were unpopular, knowing that it would cost them votes in the future, but did so for the better good of humanity, for society, and they paid the price. And certainly their amygdalas were on fire. And they get praised for it 50 years later. But at the moment, they're not being praised for going against the group. They're considered not good team players. Now, it is good to be a team player unless you know the team is going off the tracks. You know, if they're going in the wrong direction, it's important to be able to speak up. But it, you don't always get rewarded for doing it in your lifetime. I'm a bit of a word nerd, Elliot, and I looked at this source or the etymology of the word sycophants, and it comes from this old words that meant the giver of figs. So if you picture yourself in the marketplace, you have these people who are in the marketplace selling their goods, and they offer people figs and they're like, Elliot, you look fantastic today, have a fig. To, so I try and entice you towards my stall. But you call them mind guards, these people who filter the information, because it may not be information people want to hear. And we saw this with the with the Challenger disaster and those executives in Morton Teocall who acted like mind guards. You know, it, there's always a tension in anything like, you know, space launches, for example. You, need, you want to get the, the thing off the ground on time 
and you think that, and you also think there may be something a little bit wrong with it. Um, and yet, if if you don't speak up and the thing explodes, that's a real disaster for everyone concerned. Um, and every disaster that NASA has had uh, in its space launches um, has been a matter of, that could have been avoided uh, if people had been extra cautious, but there was no reward in being extra cautious. We've mentioned experiments and you've run so many of these experiments, but you're also very generous in mentioning other experiments run by other people, one of which we've alluded to several times is that famous experiment by Stanley Milgram. So with Milgram, he wanted to show that people will perform certain acts, even though it goes against their very being or how they actually feel, depending on obedience, depending on the person telling them what to do. So Stanley Milgram recruited a bunch of people. These were not simply college students. They were um, people from all walks of life. And he eventually repeated the experiment in a great many different countries uh, to see, to, to see, you know, our, you know, af right after the Second World War, people thought maybe the German people through character or personality or disposition might be more obedient to authority than the Brits or than the Americans. Not true. And here's, here's the experiment as he set it up. Two people come in for an experiment. One of them is an accomplice, but they, they don't know it. And they're, let's say they're middle-aged people and they're the accomplice pretends to be a salesman as is the other guy. And then he flips a coin to decide they're going to do an experiment in learning. He flips a coin to decide who is going to be the teacher and who's going to be the learner. Okay. Um, and then they get in separate rooms, but the learner is attached to electrical gear and the teacher is supposed to give him a word and it's a word association test that he's memorized. He's supposed to have learned it. One word is associated with another cat, maybe associated with dog and uh, et cetera. And then if he gets the wrong answer or no answer at all, he gives him a, an electric shock and it begins with a very mild shock of 15 volts. And you know, the, the, the teacher and the learner both experience the shock initially, so they know what's going on. And every time he gets the wrong answer, it the shock gets increased 15 or 20 volts, all the way up to where it says on the rear stat, 460 volts, caution, dangerous shock hazard, okay? Now, the teacher is the real participant. The guy in the next room is not even attached to the electrical wires. The teacher can't see him, but the teacher thinks he's attached. Okay. And after a while, the guy is giving several wrong answers. And each time he turns, he hits the toggle switch for a higher shock level. Milgram asked a bunch of psychiatrists how far they think people will go in delivering these electric shocks. And then he asked ordinary people how far they thought people would go. He, he described the experiment in great detail, more detail than I just described it. And the psychiatrist said, oh, they might go up to 70 or 80 or 90 volts. But, you know, once it starts getting painful, they'll stop. Almost everybody will stop. Every, and the ordinary people said pretty much the same thing. Two out of three people went all the way to the end, in spite of the fact that after a couple of hundred volts, the guy in the next room starts screaming, demanding to be let out. 
saying this is very painful, saying he's got a heart condition. Let me out, let me out, let me out. And the guy will look at the experimenter and saying, he's saying he's got a heart condition. And all the experimenter says is, for the sake of the experiment, you must go on. And the guy's okay and goes on. He, the subject, the, the participant breaks into a sweat. The sweat is dripping off his forehead. He's clearly anxious. He's soaking through his shirt, but he's doing it in compliance to an authority figure. This to me is one of the most startling experiments I've ever seen. And it's really well done. And it doesn't matter. It, it, in England, they do it. In Germany, they do it. In Japan, they do it. In everywhere, they do it. Women do it as much as men. It, there doesn't seem to be any real differences. Now, initially, he did the experiment at Yale University. So people, including me, said to him, hey, you know, you've got the prestige of Yale working for you. You may want to take it out of there. And he did. He took it to it, an, the industrial area of Bridgeport, Connecticut, in a sort of a rundown office building. He did the study that didn't have the imprimatur, imprimatur of Yale University, but was just a, a, a piece of research being done. Uh, and this, he got slightly less results, less impressive results when Yale wasn't involved, but it was still very powerful. It's an amazing study, and it shows how, how far people will go in blind obedience to authority, gentle people hurting another person, and perhaps causing fatal damage. Who knows? It's so fascinating. What I find so fascinating about it, Elliot, by the way, we've skipped over so much. I just want to say that to our audience. I have skipped over so much studies, so many gems of information here to get us to cognitive dissonance, which is one of the main drops in the book, all lead roads lead to cognitive dissonance. Because throughout the book, you talk about how we confabulate how we justify our behaviors, how we make these excuses for self preservation, self justification, and a host of other things. But I wanted to get to cognitive dissonance, because I really want to share this because this is at the source of so many of our poor decisions in life. But one thing I, I just wanted to mention is really important, because I know a lot of people who listen to this show will be careful of what information they feed themselves. And this idea of a mind diet is really important. For example, Elliot, you say in the book that those people who listen to the news on a regular basis have a more negative view of the world. Those people who consume more violent information actually see the world as a more violent place. And this is quite important. Maybe we'll just share a very brief word on that before we get into cognitive dissonance itself. The only thing I, I would caution people about is a phenomenon which is a, a corollary of cognitive dissonance theory, which we will get into, which is called the confirmation bias. And people like to listen to or watch the media where they're pretty sure it's going to confirm the bias they already have. So uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know the situation uh, in the UK, but in America, uh, any right wing person will be watching Fox News, which <laughs> which doesn't say very much about the impeachment of Donald Trump or the attempt to <laughs> to take over the government and 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 obviate the election or anything like that. They don't say anything about that. They do say something about it. They say, oh, the people are overreacting to uh, simple, you know, they were just like tourists walking through the Capitol building. Yeah, tourists with with clubs and, and, <laughs> and things like that. Uh, so you can find the media that, especially now with the internet, you can find the media that will support any viewpoint. And I think that's it is a dangerous trap. We should be exposed to a wide range of things that uh, if we want to be good citizens who are capable of learning something new. We don't want to stick, stay with the blinders on. So that's that um, 
it's, it's a little out of sequence, but uh, let me now just describe what cognitive dissonance is, which is the single most important theory in the history of social psychology. And this is the theory that Leon Festinger was just beginning to develop when I met him. And Festinger's theory is if a person has two cognitions, ideas, thoughts, beliefs, where the one is the opposite of the other, it creates a state of tension and stress and motivation within him to reduce it, um, just like hunger. It's a negative drive state like hunger or in intense thirst or anything like that. Uh, but it's all it happens all in the head. So for example, the classic example, if you smoke a pack and a half of cigarettes a day, and then you read increasingly powerful evidence that cigarette smoking causes cancer, and you have a wife and small kids, and yet you, you continue to smoke, those two cognitions are dissonant. And how does a person reduce dissonance? Well, the clearest way, the cleanest way to reduce this dissonance is to stop smoking. But as many people have found out, that's not easy to do. So what people often do is find some other they, they work on that other cognition. Maybe it doesn't cause cancer. Maybe the data aren't really clear. After all, you can't really do an experiment on it. So it's just correlational data. A lot of people who smoke die, but maybe they do other things that cause them to die. Who knows? Or maybe the filter tip will trap those terrible car carcinogens. Uh, or, hey, I maybe I'd rather live a shorter but more enjoyable life and cigarette smoking is enjoyable or maybe i have this image of myself as a debonair person who flaunts death and then and still continues to smoke or look if i didn't smoke so much i might overeat and everybody knows that obesity is a cause of death as well so all of those things can come in any of them or all of them can come in as a way of helping people live with being a smoker while at the same time knowing that it might kill them and they might die young from it. I, I can illustrate it best by talking about my very first experiment uh, that I did uh, with, a, with a fellow graduate student when I was at Stanford, a guy named Judson Mills, uh, called the initiation experiment, which I mentioned earlier, which is if people go through a severe initiation in order to get into a group, and then they listen to a group discussing things that they had just joined, a group they had just joined, and it's a long-term group, and they went through a severe initiation to get into that group, and the group is boring, dull, ridiculous, and, they, and they're sitting there listening to that group, some people went through a severe initiation. Some through, people went through a mild initiation. Some people got into the group without going through an initiation at all. And the initiation was really embarrassing uh, and difficult. Um, and then after they listened to that group, they're asked to evaluate the group. How interesting was it? How nice are the people? How smart are the people, et cetera. Now, According to dissonance theory, anything negative about the group is dissonant with having gone through a severe initiation in order to get into it. Why would I go through a severe initiation and get into a lousy group? Therefore, people who go through a severe initiation will downgrade the importance of the negative stuff that they were exposed to and will focus on the few positive things that were in the group so that within a very short time, within 10 minutes or so, they have convinced themselves that the group is much better than the people who went through a mild or no initiation at all, because those people have very little to lose. They didn't invest as much, so they're not as motivated to see 
that group in the best possible light. Now, this is internalization. They're convincing themselves that the group is interesting, the people in the severe condition. If I tried to tell those people in my most convincing manner, you know, this is really an interesting group, they would never believe me. But they were able to convince themselves that it was an interesting group. And that's what makes cognitive dissonance theory so very, very powerful. Different from the people who weren't wearing masks at the Santa Cruz beach that I mentioned before, they paid a thousand dollars, but they didn't convince motivated to do it. But these people convinced themselves that the group was a good thing. The people who went through the mild initiation or didn't go through an initiation at all wanted, wanted to get out of the group. They didn't want to come to the next meeting. The people who went through the severe initiation were looking forward to the next meeting. An amazing transformation. The difference was startling. Uh, now, within a few years, I had modified Festinger's theory because I was aware of the fact that I became aware of the fact that we were making our clearest predictions when dissonance was between a behavior and a person's self-concept. Most people have a positive self-concept. Most people think that they're smarter than average, that they're more, co more competent than average, that they're better drivers than average, et cetera. Better parents than average. Hardly anyone will tell you, yeah, I'm a lousy parent. No, they, most people have a, a fairly high self-concept. My, my change in the theory turned it from a theory about attitudes to a theory about the self. So if we, and I'm saying, whenever a person does something that goes against his own self-concept, he experienced the, the most powerful dissonance and therefore is most more highly motivated to, to take some action. And so if we take that initiation experiment, Festinger said, and I said at that time in 1958, I said, um, a cognition I went through a severe initiation to get into that group is dissonant with everything negative about that group. Now, or within a few years, I changed that to say, my cognition that I am a smart, competent, reasonable person is through a severe initiation and in order to get into a really lousy group. That just goes against who I think I am. I made a terrible mistake. And instead of admitting that I made a terrible mistake, I will convince myself that the group is a lot better than I thought it was. I think it's fascinating when you look at our behavior, interacting with rewards and incentives. A great example you give, Elliot, in the book is that of Jack Landry, who was a marketing manager for Philip Morris in the US over 30, three decades ago. And you pull an excerpt from the Washington Post at the time, and it says, Jack Landry pulls what must be his 30th Marlboro of the day out of one of his two packs on his desks, lights the match, and tells how he doesn't believe all those reports about smoking and cancer and emphysema. He has just begun to market yet another cigarette campaign for Philip Morris and is brimming over with the satisfaction over its prospects. But how does he square with his conscience the spending of 10 million over the next year to lure people into smoking his new brand? What does he say? It's not a matter of that, says Landry, Philip Morris's vice president for marketing. Nearly half the adults in this country smoke. It's a basic commodity for them. I'm serving a public need. This is the type of dissonance we see when people are awarded for one behavior when they know perhaps it's not the best thing for society. 
Yeah. And the more he's being rewarded, the less need he has to reduce the distance. And the interesting thing that we did an experiment on that um, when in Festinger's lab uh, that I helped with, which is you get a person to do a really boring task for an hour like packing spools or turning a screw a half turn, something like a person might do on the assembly line of a, of a car company. And um, then afterwards was to see whether, if people are told in advance that this is an interesting task, will they like the task better? This is, this is a lie, okay? But it's, it's a just, it's what, the way we, what we told the student, the subject. And then we say, I usually have, I hired someone to do this, but he didn't show up for some reason. I wonder, would you mind telling that guy out there who's waiting that you two were just, well, you were just through the experiment. Would you tell him that you really found, you were in the control condition. That is, nobody told you anything about how interesting it was. Now I'd like you to tell him that it was really an interesting task. Uh, you know, just sit next to him and chat with him and say, oh yeah, you really loved it. It was really fun and all of that. And the guy said, yeah. And, I, and in one condition, you offer him $20, which in 1958 was a lot of money, or you offer him $1 for doing it. Now here's what's really interesting. Uh, according to, the, the dominant theory at the time was reinforcement theory. Radical behaviorism, B.F. Skinner. The more you reward somebody, the more they do it. And through the, the concept that they had of secondary reinforcement, anything associated with reward is going to be liked better than if it's not associated with reward. And the more reward, the more they're going to like it. What we predicted was the people who told that lie, who told that other person that the, ta the boring task that I just did, if I tell that person that the boring task was really interesting for $1, I will come to believe it more than if I tell the same lie for $20. This is really earth-shattering research. Nobody would have predicted that prior to cognitive dissonance theory because if I'm paid $20 for telling a lie, I can easily convince myself that I sold my soul to the devil for $20 and it was a bargain. It was worth it, okay? <laughs> um, rather than associated with reward will make me like the task better, I'm saying associated with lack of reward, lying about something for nothing, for a dollar, is not sufficient for you to feel good about it. It may be sufficient for you to tell the lie, but not feel good about it, so you have to convince yourself, but you know, turning those screws, I was really getting a lot of good exercise in my wrist, or it was really, it gave me a chance to sort of meditate while I was doing that routine task. You find things about it that you're going to love. And that's powerful stuff. And it has all kinds of ramifications, for example, for child rearing. I did an experiment with children it's called the forbidden toy experiment, where we, we had kids in a, in a preschool playing with a whole bunch of toys. And we found there was one that they really liked a lot. And we took it and we put it up on the table and said, you can play with all those toys, toys on the floor, but you can't play with the one on the table. Okay. Um, and in one condition, we gave them an extremely mild threat. If you, if you play with that toy, I'll just think you're a baby. And another one we said, if you play with that toy, I'll think you're a baby and I'll take my toys, all my toys, and I'll go home and I'll never come back again, okay? And my research assistant who was doing, actually running the, the experiment, 
very attractive, warm guy. They really liked his coming into the school. He's been coming in for a couple of weeks. They really liked having this stuff. So that was a severe punishment for them. <laughs> then afterwards, we had them rate all the toys. And the people in the severe condition continued to like that toy, whereas the people in the mild threat condition actually convinced themselves, ah, who wants to play with that toy anyway? It's a, it's a dumb toy. I like these other ones better. Powerful stuff. Now, if you substitute aggressing against a smaller child for the attractive toy, you can see how you can begin to get people to internalize values if they're able to convince themselves that the reason they refrained from doing it is because they didn't like doing it because it's not a good thing to do. And that's what, as a parent, that's what you want to do. We even have a direct experiment on that one. Again, there were, we between between like 1958 and 1970, we did hundreds of experiments, some of which were you know, okay, but some of which were really powerful on testing the theory. And one of the experiments that my fellow graduate student Judson Mills did was exactly on cheating. He had he set up a situation where kids had the ability to cheat and they thought they could do it without getting observed, but we had a way to observe, observe them. And here's the thing. If you, if you take, if you ask people their attitude toward cheating, how bad a thing is it? Or yeah, how bad a thing is it? And you get two people who feel almost exactly the same way about cheating, like on a test that it's not a good thing to do, it's really wrong, but it's a victimless crime. Uh, everybody does it, everybody is doing it. I'd be pretty stupid if I didn't do it because it would put me at a disadvantage, etc. cetera. Um, so there, we call this uh, the pyramid of choice because it looks like a pyramid where you get two people standing at the very tip of the pyramid, which means they, their, their value about cheat, their, their opinion of cheating is almost identical, just the way I just described it. Whereas on the bottom rung here is um, attitude toward cheatings after the fact. And let's say one of them decides to cheat and the other one decides not to cheat. The person who decided to cheat slides down one end, one side of the pyramid toward an attitude toward cheating that's very different from the one he had beforehand. See, both of those people, let's take the medical school example. I have to do well on this exam in order to get into medical school. And then I'm gonna be a terrific doctor, but I go into the exam which will get either get me into medical school or not. And although I know the material, I'm so nervous that I pull a blank. And then I find out, I look at, I look up and I happen to be sitting next in the class who also happens to have the biggest and most legible handwriting. And all I have to do is strain my neck a little bit and look over her shoulder and I can get the answers and get into medical school. But cheating is wrong, okay? Whether you cheat or not in that situation, you're going to experience dissonance because if you cheat, it goes against your notion that cheating is a bad thing. If you decide not to cheat, it goes against your notion of your of that. If you decide not to cheat, you wanted to be a doctor and you could have been a terrific doctor, 
if only you had just taken that one little step and you didn't do it. So both of those people are experiencing dissonance, but dissonance reduction takes them in opposite directions. That's what that pyramid does. So you're sliding down the pyramid in opposite directions. The person who cheated softens his attitude toward cheating. The person who resisted the temptation to cheat hardens his attitude toward cheating. Whereas an hour before, he was going to tell you, well, it's a victimless crime, and it doesn't really hurt anybody, and yeah, people do it. It's not a good thing to do. Now he's saying, what do you mean it's a victimless crime? <laughs> what about all those people who didn't cheat, who aren't going to be able to go to medical school because I cheated? I think we should punish people who cheat. We should kick them out of school immediately without any redress. We should maybe put them in a, their head through a, a hole and throw rotten vegetables at them. They really should be hum publicly humiliated, publicly shamed. Why? Because I resisted the temptation to cheat and therefore they should have also. That's the cognitive dissonance in action. And, we, and in Mills's experiment, we saw that very thing played out. Uh, perfect experiment. And it, 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 it demonstrates the power of cognitive dissonance to lead to permanent changes in attitude. I love it. I absolutely love it. And I'm so, so happy to share it with our audience. And from the, the, the guru on cognitive dissonance as well, which is such a bonus. And I again, my thanks to you. But I, I find it so fascinating. I'm just so fascinated by the human mind and how we make decisions and how knowing things about ourselves, if we allow that to happen, if we allow ourselves to question our decisions, that actually we can make better decisions. That is the core of all this. And I find it so important for us to be able to understand ourselves a little bit more so we can actually get more out of ourselves and maybe live the life that we want to live. We have that tendency, but, you know, Carol Towers and I wrote a book called Mistakes Were Made But Not By Me, which is bringing cognitive dissonance theory into the real world and talking about the kinds of things that people do to justify their decisions. But what we end up saying is this, is two things that are both very important. One is most of the decisions we make are small and trivial. And one of the great advantages of reducing dissonance by justifying our decisions is that it helps us sleep at night. And we don't want to be tossing and turning because, because at a cocktail party, I attributed a particular poem uh, to was really uh, Wordsworth's poem. And I think, oh, I made a fool of myself. I was, I, I, I overstepped my bounds and now they think I'm an idiot or whatever. If I could, if, if that person could convince himself, hardly anyone noticed, it doesn't really matter. They don't think any less of me for it anyway. He'll sleep better at night. For issues like that, dissonance reduction is a very valuable thing. That's why it's, it's hung on so long. That's why it's, it, it's, it, it's a good thing to do when the stakes aren't high. But for important decisions, really important decisions, where we're going to change our attitudes, when we make an important decision, first of all, we should try to make the right decision. But secondly, if we make the wrong decision, and we start convincing ourselves that it was the right decision, we have to stop in our tracks and say, do I really believe it was the right decision or am I merely justifying a bad decision and in effect throwing good money after bad because I may be digging myself deeper into a hole. And if you happen to be, for example, just to take a random example, the president of the United States, and you've decided to go to war in Iraq against Saddam Hussein because you believe that he has weapons of mass destruction that he's about to use on his neighbors and maybe on us. And it turns out that there are no weapons of mass destruction. What did George Bush do with that one? 
Well, what he did was he said, well, I'm really embarrassed to say that there were no weapons of mass destruction. We, well, first, first he said, oh, Iraq is a big country. We'll find them. We'll find them. But they didn't find them. And then when they didn't find them, he admitted that he was embarrassed, but he said, but you know what? Saddam was a bad guy anyway. It was a good thing that we brought him down. Look at all the good we've done. Well, and then you bring in more troops, more troops, more troops, and it becomes one of the endless wars that we now have been finding ourselves in as a, because George Bush needed to reduce distance. He needed to reduce being there in the first place. He couldn't simply withdraw the troops and say, screw it. Um, uh, I made a mistake, and I'm really sorry. That's that's powerful stuff. You know, what one thought struck me throughout the whole book, Elliot, and it often strikes me, this thought is, how are those people who do call things out constructed? For example, you say in the book, and I use sport because it's a mental model that I've had for for a decade, and when some teams lose games, actually, when most teams lose games, they look to external factors and blame the referee, blame the weather conditions, blame maybe sickness in the team or an injury, while the teams that win it always put them down to internal factors, things they did in order to win the game, the right game plan, the right mental state, all this kind of thing. But it made me think that for those people who are inclined you, the listener of this show as well, those people who are inclined to speak up against behaviors that they don't think are consistent with the principles of life, perhaps it's the wrong thing for the organization. What's going on with those people? Because it strikes me you're one of those people who calls things out. Because for me, I'd let things dwell, I dwell on the, the things I didn't do for example, in sport, I could be given man of the match and I'd still go, oh, I wish I didn't make that mistake in the game. I wish it didn't weigh on my... And then I'd wish it didn't weigh on my mind afterwards and I wish I could actually just totally enjoy it. But I find difficulty in that. Not always, I'll tell you. When you gave that example, what came to mind is when I wake up at four o'clock in the morning and I'm unable to get back to sleep, one of the things that comes to mind is a baseball game I played in when I was 14 years old. And we were behind by two runs and had the bases loaded. And the pitch, I was up with two outs. And I just wanted to get on base any way I could. And the pitcher was ferocious. He had a ferocious fastball. And I worked the count to three and two. And the next pitch was off the plate by a couple of inches, I thought, and a little below the knees. And I let the pitch go by, and the umpire called me out. And I yelled at the umpire, I screamed, and I told my friends, that, that pitch was wide and low. And, and then a couple of days later, I thought about it, and I thought, you're a jerk. You should have swung at the ball because it was close enough to have been called a strike. And the least you could have done is foul it off and make the guy throw another pitch. I still think about that at four o'clock in the morning. Can you believe it? I, I can't let it go. <laughs> can't let it go. <laughs> it's good to know you're human, brother. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, very very so let's get to something i mentioned at the start the jigsaw classroom and the jigsaw classroom elliot you say was probably some of your most rewarding work and you've done a lot of rewarding work and uh here i'm actually trying to implant a thought here forget the baseball elliot you have done amazing work <laughs> in the world but i thought about jigsaw I thought about Jigsaw from the perspective of there's a, uh, I don't know where I, I got this story from, but when you walk into a room 
and for example a kitchen and the tap is overflowing do you grab a mop or do you turn off the tap and i felt jigsaw was turning off the tap it was intercepting segregation and polarization and improving interethnic relationships from a very very young age that would actually change how somebody's life could go and jigsaw is some of the most rewarding work that you've done the thing uh, uh, that's important about jigsaw most important to me um uh, well you did this beautiful interview um uh, with George Lakoff uh, that I watched. And uh, it was terrific. You, you asked great questions and he gave great answers. And one of the things he said was that in a democracy, um, education is terribly important and um, empathy, building empathy is terribly important. And I agree on both counts. And what Jigsaw does is both of those things that that we really need to educate our kids to be empathic with all people and to be receptive to all people in a democracy, especially a, a pluralistic democracy like the UK and like America. Uh, we, ha we have all kinds of people. Um, what uh, Jigsaw Classroom is a, a, a technique that I developed in a very um, stressful situation. I was living in Austin, te Texas at the time, teaching at the University of Texas, when the schools were desegregated for the first time. This was in 1971. Um, the United States Supreme Court decision in 1954 held for the first time that the, the doctrine of separate but equal schools for black kids, white kids, Mexican-American kids, as long as the schools had equal facilities, it was okay. But in 1954, using data from social psychology, by the way, the Supreme Court ruled that the mere fact of segregating black kids from their white counterparts is discriminatory because the black kids know that they're being segregated, not because the dominant culture thinks they're so wonderful, they know they're being segregated because they're black, the white kids don't want to associate with them, or at least their parents don't want their kids associating with them, and that that lowers their self-esteem in a way perhaps never to be undone, which is in the words of uh, Supreme Court Justice Earl Warren, in a way perhaps never to be undone. It, they're made to feel um, inferior so they, it's nonsense to say, even if the schools were equal in every way in terms of the amount of chalk and the, best, the books to be read and how nice the furniture is and stuff like that, their self-esteem is lowered and that makes it unequal. That happened in 1954. So Austin was desegregating in 1971 and um, within a few weeks, all hell broke loose fist fights in the corridors of high schools and junior high schools between black kids, white kids, Mexican-American kids, racial fist fights. Schools had to be shut down. The assistant superintendent, superintendent of schools happened to be a former student of mine um, who called me up and said, what can we do? Now, the problem was that Austin, like most cities in America and, and probably elsewhere, are, is residentially segregated. So the black kids and Mexican-American kids lived on the other side of the superhighway. The white kids lived in the hilly section of Austin. Uh, they hardly ever got to see each other until schools were desegregated and then they were thrust together in the same classrooms for the first time ever, okay? Um, and so the assistant superintendent of schools asked me to come in and said, what can you do about that? And um, I, got a, I, I made a deal with him and with his boss, the superintendent. I said, look, 
I don't want to just put on a Band-Aid. If I find something and apply it and it works, I want you to implement it. And they agreed to do it, okay? Which was a great bargain I learned late, later in my mind because school systems, are, it's very hard for them to, um, they don't change very easily. My students and I walked into the classroom, several classrooms, and stayed in the back, a couple of people in each classroom. And I said, I told them, I instructed them, I want you to observe what's going on in the classroom. I want you to pretend you're a visitor from Mars that you've never been in a classroom before, fourth, fifth, sixth grade. Write down everything you see happening. And then at the end of the hour, I want you to rank order the frequency of each of those things. Pretend you're a visitor from Mars. You've never been in a school before. Don't have any preconceived notions. And this was important because what they saw happening was teacher stands in the front of the room, asks the question, and five or six hands go up. And they don't just simply go up the way you or I would raise our hand. They go up. The kids leap out of their chairs. They, 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 they want the teacher to call on me, call on me. And they're stretching and straining. And the teacher calls on one. And when the teacher calls on one, you can hear a groan go up from the kids who had their hands up but weren't called on. Why? Because the second most pers important person in their lives, second only to their mothers, perhaps, my apology to all us fathers, but the teacher is very important. They had a chance to impress her, to show her how smart they were, and they, she didn't call on them. When the groan goes up, they're hoping that that kid who, who got called on comes up with the wrong answer. Because then, if the teacher then asks the question again, that raises the stakes because now we know it's not such an easy answer. So if I get called on, I get more reward. Meantime, most of the kids, the other kids that do, who do not have their hands up are looking down at their shoes because they don't know the answer. And the last thing that can happen, if you remember back to the time when you were in the sixth grade, is to make eye contact with the teacher when you don't know the answer, because then she's liable to call on you and you're gonna be embarrassed and humiliated. So they're looking down at their shoes. And so what they conclude, what my students who were observing, and I observed the same thing, number one thing, the classroom is a highly competitive thing, a high, highly competitive place where kids are striving against each other for the esteem of the teacher. And in that kind of situation, this wasn't, um, this wasn't randomly distributed. For the most part, the kids who had their hands up were white. The kids who were looking at the shoes, some of them were white, but most, but the blacks and, and uh, Mexican-American kids were mostly looking at the shoes almost entirely because it turns out that the schools were never separate and equal. They weren't equal. The black kids that had a, the black kids coming into the sixth grade were reading at a fifth grade level, whereas the white kids coming into the sixth grade were reading at a seventh grade level. So their reading skills, because of poor educational facilities, were two full grade levels behind the white kids. So here we have a highly competitive situation where the minority kids were guaranteed to lose. If someone had invented a style of learning that was guaranteed to make desegregation fail, they couldn't have done a better job. The combination of poorer preparation for desegregation and, um, and the competitive nature of the classroom made it a situation where the minority kids were guaranteed to lose. And what that did was exacerbate the existing stereotypes. 
the white kids fought the minority kids who were stupid or lazy or both, and the minority kids fought the white kids who were show-offs uh, and o- overly assertive, overly competitive, etc. So what do you do in a situation like that? It took us a few days, but my students and I, my graduate students and I, invented a cooperative technique for education where we broke the kids into five person groups, five or six, or it could have been four, depending upon the number of kids in the classroom, but mostly five or six person groups. And we assigned, if there was, if these were a team and we made the groups as diverse as possible, white kids, black kids, Mexican-American kids, boys, girls, smart kids, assertive kids, um, as opposed to quieter kids. We had them all, we tried to get as many of the different kinds of kids into a group as we could. And we broke the lesson down into n number of parts. If there were five people in a group, there were five parts of the group. Each kid had one segment. So for example, if they're learning lives of great Americans. So they're learning about the biography of Eleanor Roosevelt. We we broke her biography down into N number of paragraphs, let's say five paragraphs, one for each kid. Each kid has one paragraph and the only access you as a member of the group have to that black kid's paragraph is by listening to him recite it, okay? So you have to pay attention to that kid. Um, You might have wanted to heckle him when he, if let's say Carlos, a Mexican American kid, English is his second language. He speaks it okay, but with with a heavy accent and the kids make fun of him. And so he's really nervous and shy about talking. He now has to recite before he was just sitting there looking at his shoes. Now he has to give his paragraph. And it may be difficult for him to say, to give it because he's nervous. Initially, the kids do their heckling behavior. Ah, you don't know it, you're stupid, whatever, in their group. But teacher is now wandering around from group to group. Every once in a while, she makes an intervention, which is like, if she hears that, she will say, that might be fun for you to say, but it's not going to help you learn about Eleanor Roosevelt's middle years. And the quiz is in 10 minutes. Kids, after a few days, realize that they're really interdependent. They really have to count on each other. And so they start, instead of heckling, it's like heckling a member of your own baseball team, right? But you don't want to do that. So they start listening. Not only do they start listening, they start paying attention and they start asking really good questions. They become really good interviewers to help Carlos bring out the material that he has inside of him that's in there He just needs encouragement and he needs people to really be paying attention and not heckling him. And once that develops, and it only takes a few days, all kinds of things happen. And what happens after six weeks when we collected our data, prejudice went down, kids liked each other better, everybody in their group, and then we divided, we split up the groups and reformed them into other teams. Within a short time, people really liked each other better. They liked school more. Absenteeism was down compared to a control condition. And the control condition consisted of the same material being taught by teachers who were designated as the best teachers in the system were now competing against teachers, average teachers who were using Jigsaw. So we stacked the cards against us. They did better on exams. The the, uh, minority kids went up 
an average of 11 percentage points uh, over what they had over what people in the control conditions were doing. Uh, so a kid with, with a who was getting a, a a 72 was now getting an 83, which is not bad. Um, and the important thing, the, the most important thing was the empathy. Uh, many years later, uh, we worked on empathy and one of my graduate students here at um, University of California, Santa Cruz, Diane Bridgman, a brilliant young woman, did a study of empathy in kids in kids using jigsaw as opposed to kids in traditional schools. And it's a very interesting study. I'm gonna give it to you in detail. Um, she showed them a set of cartoons. I'll give you like one cartoon that she used. It shows, it, these are just little stick figures, a series of little pictures. Um, Kid is at the airport with his father. His father's wearing a suit, carrying a briefcase, and the mother is there too. And he sees the father get on the plane and the plane fly off. And the kid is looking very sad because his father is leaving town for some reason. Next picture, um, the, the, the uh, postal worker, the, the postman, is delivering a package to the kid's house, brings it in the house, gives it to the kid. He opens the package and there's a toy airplane. And the kid bursts into tears. Diane asked the kids, why do you think the kid burst into tears? And all of the kids knew the answer. The reason the kid burst into tears is because the plane reminded him of the fact that his father got on a plane, flew out of town and is still gone. And that made him sad. Almost all the kids knew that. Then she asked the key question. What do you think the postman thinks about why the kid burst into tears? In kids, in traditional classrooms, make, most of them make the same error. They assume that the postman is privy to the same information that they're privy to. But the postman didn't get to see the father fly off in the airplane. So, but in the jigsaw classroom, almost all of the kids knew the answer. Gee, I don't know what the postman thinks. Maybe he thinks the kid is a little bit weird. Maybe he thinks the kid is afraid of airplanes. That's empathy. We can say to ourselves, what difference does it make whether the kid knows what the postman thinks? A lot. Because what Jigsaw does is increases the speed with which a kid will be able to put himself in the place of another person. And that is empathy. That is an, a wonderful illustration of empathy. Um, and it's a terribly important trait, which in Jigsaw, the kids need it. If you're in a competitive classroom, you don't need to know anything about the other kids. All you need to do is raise your hand and get called on. And all you're hoping is the other kid fails. If you're in a jigsaw classroom, you have to understand that when Susie is giving her presentation, she's a little nervous and she might need some help. She might need patience. Whereas Charles is flamboyant and he talks too much and maybe he needs to be brought down a peg. You need to start paying attention to the characteristics of the other kids. You need to be able to put yourself in their shoes in order to be a good Jigsaw me member. So the process is more important than the content. What you learn from the process of being in a cooperative group is how to be a good team player and being a good team player implies empathy.
You really need to know who you're dealing with. And, and, and that's what makes Jigsaw so successful. It's such a beautiful project to have started, initiated. It's really wonderful. But, but it made me think about so many of the biases that you had discussed earlier on. For example, self-attribution bias that we actually associate all our wins to our own or to ourselves rather than the conditions we're bo bro born into, for example, which is part of privilege. We don't know that we're privileged. We don't experience it because we don't know what it's like to be without that privilege, for example, and how that leads to segregation in the classroom, how that leads to me thinking, oh, that kid's dumb and I might not know that, well, that kid has gone through an unbelievably abusive childhood. They've experienced broken home, perhaps the death of a parent, perhaps drugs in the home, perhaps they've been beaten. Horrific upbringings for so many people. And I make judgments based on my own experiences. So that, And then it made me think about actually the workplace. Just like there's the jigsaw classroom, what if there was a jigsaw workplace where I didn't compete with my colleague they weren't seen as a competitor, and actually they were a collaborator. And in this world of rapid change, how useful that would be. We had Luke Burgess on the show in the past, and he talked to us about this theory called mimeticism, where we actually become kind of mimes of each other, we compete with each other. If we're both competing for the same thing, we're going to be more intensively uh, competitive with each other and less friendly. And this happens in families, this happens in friendships all the time. This is keeping up with the Joneses. And we do the same thing in organizations. So I could go down so many rabbit holes with Jigsaw. Now, I don't know if you have it in you, I'm going to hold back the tears for this is the beautiful story about how Jigsaw culminated in the change of behavior for the students that participated in Jigsaw. And there's the beautiful story of little Willie Johnson. And I thought we'd share this as a beautiful analogy, a beautiful story for actually what happens when you do turn off the tap and change behaviors early in people's lives. Yeah, well, it, I once did a, um, a workshop for uh, on Jigsaw for teachers uh, in the South Bronx. Uh, which is um, a part of New York City, uh, where a lot of uh, poor people, it's, it's not a great place to live. A lot of poor people live there, a lot of minorities live there, which is fine, but there's a lot of drug deals going on, there's, there's violence, and uh, it's difficult. And uh, I did a workshop for teachers who were magnificent. The teachers were terrific and really excited. And um, Several months later, I can't, I can't even remember, maybe six or seven months later, I got a call from one, one of the teachers. I was sitting in my office. And I got this phone call, and she said, Dr. Aaron, I just have to tell you that what just happened. And she took the kids on a field trip to the Whitney Museum in, in uh, Midtown Manhattan. Um, now, the... Uh, uh, the distance uh, between uh, the South Bronx and the Whitney Museum is only about 20 minutes, maybe 25 minutes on the on the subway. But the uh, the, the the psychological difference d distance is enormous. So she took these kids, and many of them were had gone were going to museum for the first time, and she showed them um, a painting. Um, Trying to think, what, what it was it? Um, oh yeah, it was a it was a a, a paint a paint. There was a, a an artist whose name was Gorky, and uh, it was a a self portrait of him and his mother, him as a child and his mother, and um, and she she took them. There was a portrait on on the wall. And then she opened a book that she had with her and passed it around to her kids, the kids in her class. And there was a, um, a photograph of, that same, of, of those two people, a real photograph, not, not of the painting, but of the people. And she said to the kids, 
Why do you think the artist went to the trouble of painting this portrait when he already had a picture of it, which is much more realistic, the picture is? It's a terrific question. And then the teacher said, uh, the, then what she told me is that one of the kids said, oh, the painting is bigger. And the kids said, well, the painting is in color and the, uh, the photograph is only in black and white. And then um, Willie Johnson, one of the smallest kids in the class, whose own mother had died of a drug overdose a year, a year earlier, um, cleared his throat to speak, which the teacher said was already a kind of a miracle because this kid never spoke in class. And he's, but before Jigsaw, he had never spoken in class. And here he spoke up and, and he said, he pointed to one aspect of the painting, which is really a quite remarkable part of the painting, where, which is the hands of the mother, which instead of being real, real hands, they, they look, it looked like she's wearing white fluffy mittens or something. And he said, maybe he painted his mother's hands that way because he remembered her hands being so soft. Uh, and then she said there was absolute silence uh, for 30 or 40 seconds, which had never happened before in that. <laughs> and then the, the biggest, toughest kid in the class came over and put his arm around uh, Willie Johnson's shoulders. And that, and the teacher said, I, I just looked at that and I was overwhelmed. And of course, when she told me that story, I was overwhelmed too, because uh, these are kids that are not, um, are not used to expressing affection for each other. And the big tough kid was obviously one of the, one of the class bullies. But one of the things Jigsaw does is, is reduce bullying and, and increase empathy. And um, so that's, it's stories like that. And there are a lot of them that really give me the, the real feeling for how this stuff works and increases my feeling of the tragedy that it's very hard for a new technique like Jigsaw to break into the curriculum of uh, the, edu the educational system. And that's when I sort of, I would love to be the czar of education in my country. And I would, I would force everybody to do Jigsaw uh, because it has, as far as I can see, there's no downside. It has all of these positive things. It, it increases the grades, especially of minority kids. It makes kids like school better. Uh, they do better on exams. And most important of all, they relate to each other with more warmth and with more empathy and things of that sort. It's, it's a, a really good technique that we stumbled on. For the one that you've heard, there's hundreds that you haven't heard. And I want to make sure you hear me. And I, I really thank you on behalf of the listeners for this show. And those people who have read your book who won't even be conscious of the fact that it's changed their view, it's given them new lenses through which to view the world and experience the world and behave in the world. And I love the mental model of the jigsaw. I think it's such a great way to think. And your work is like a jigsaw for me. Reading this book has been like a jigsaw. Each new chapter, each new segment within a chapter is like a new piece of the jigsaw that all culminates together into this beautiful work. And I know that, for example, you have the, the little 14 year old self, the 4am club, where it's keeping you awake, um, still bugging at you. But man, you look great. You're going into your 90th year. And you're still doing podcasts like this. You've got a great voice. And uh, it's just a pleasure to have you on the show. 
I'm going into my 90th year. I'm almost totally blind. Um, but, you know, uh, life goes on. And um, I enjoyed talking to you a lot. It's, uh, I love teaching. Uh, and I miss it a lot. Well, you're still doing it, man. You're still doing it. You're here. Your your work is still being spread. People are still reading your book. Jigsaw is still out there. It's still alive. Literally, people are seeing through the jigsaw lenses that you've given them. One, one thing I wanted to say to you, because you're so appreciative throughout your books, little excerpts, little nuggets here and there, the dedications to your wife, Vera. And I, I think that's a beautiful mental model. Firstly, doing so great at 90 firstly changes things for many of us and we kind of go look at Aronson there is doing great I can do it too but the other one is that your relationship is so strong with your wife Vera and that also is a great mental model to aspire to I've been very lucky and uh, I happen to marry a magnificent woman and uh, she's been um, it's been a great a, a great situation uh my kids are doing well i it's boy uh <laughs> uh i was talking to somebody <laughs> uh a few weeks ago and uh we were going over our lives and uh and uh he was talking about his own life and he said something like he he's he's a zen buddhist and uh he said uh, so he believes in reincarnation and he said god if this life is as good as it is and if it's really on an upward swing i can hardly wait till the next life <laughs> brilliant <laughs> and i and i sort of shrugged because i don't believe believe in that stuff but i thought it it does say a lot about this life i don't know about the next life but i certainly am, am like liking this one blindness and all you know i've been very lucky well, it's been such an immense pleasure for me. And I want to thank you as well for all the excerpts you sent me all the, the articles that you sent me in my preparation for the show. I by the way, I didn't need it because there was so much in the social animal and the jigsaw classroom. But I appreciate it. And I appreciate your time. Uh, more than anything, it's been absolute pleasure for me to learn from you. Um, it will make an Im impact on my world, hopefully on the listeners world, and then we can spread it out. And hopefully everybody make better decisions, have better behaviors, the behaviors become realities, and ultimately comes down to us all being on spaceship Earth, there are no passengers only crew. And it's been an immense pleasure to have you on the show, Elliot, I thank you author of the social animal, Elliot Aronson, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. What an immense pleasure it was to bring you that episode powered by our partner Zai. Zai is a global fintech innovating in their area of expertise, building integrated financial services for digital native and non native businesses. Check them out at hellozai.com. In doing so, you will be supporting us and we will be able to bring you many more shows. Thank you and see you next week.